so here we go. Uh, compound interest <coughs> formula. Uh, our formulas that are here are just plain plug and chug. So in other words, right now you'll be putting in X and getting out Y, putting in X and getting out Y, putting in X and getting out Y. Eventually we'll go both directions. In other words, put in Y, get out X. But right now it's just putting in X, getting out Y. <laughs> compound interest <laughs> formula. It says the amount, uh, the amount uh, the amount function for compound interest is a power law function in terms of time. So here are my variables. A of t, A of t is the ending amount. So I don't seem to have that listed here. So A of t is the ending amount. And A0 is the beginning amount. It's what you start out with. R is the rate that you're getting. And it says normal annual rate of interest as a decimal. N is the number of times it's compounded each year. If it's yearly, n equals 1. Semi-annually, n equals 2. Quarterly, uh, n equals 4. Uh, if I think about uh, things like the checking accounts and some of the accounts, uh, savings accounts with your banks, uh, that's usually, they figure it out on daily or monthly. With, a, with the daily, I think they do a daily average or something, and then you get a monthly interest. Monthly would be 12. So, uh, and, and that's N is the number of times it's compounded. T is time in years. So if somebody said six months, you'd have to convert that to years. That would be six divided by 12. That would be a, one half a year. Okay, so you need to understand that T is time in years. They have a tendency in this book to uh, make you change, um, uh, make you change attempt essentially units. Uh, this is an extremely important formula because a lot of what you do is governed by it and, uh, and, and as you're looking at work being in the workforce and whether you have 401ks or some other kind of, 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 of account, you're looking at everything sa they keep saying compound interest, compound interest. I mean, things will grow. You'll, you know, you put a hundred, you put a thousand dollars in now and over time it will grow and you'll end up with a million dollars or something like that. And, you know, if you just let it grow, you let, let it stay. Now, why is that? Because what compound interest does, it takes your initial amount that nothing changes. If you don't put any more money in, that initial amount changes. You get interest on that amount. They put the interest in. Then the next time they do it, they, it's going to be on the amount of money you have in there plus the interest from the last time they ended interest. You're getting interest on your interest, which is why they call it compounding. And uh, a lot of retirement accounts compound quarterly. Uh, that's four times a year. And so you want to look at, the, they keep saying, and, uh, and the power of compounding. And it's extremely powerful in terms of if you let money just sit and grow. Uh, parents, and maybe your parents did, uh, I know my sister and her husband did for their kids, they put a certain amount of money in when, when uh, they were born, and then <coughs> by the time they were 18, uh, with the interest compounded, and of course they added more, more money as time went on, but they had enough money to start funding their college education. So that's the power of compounding that you let it go, you let it grow, and then when you need it, uh, then the money is there. Most of the time, what happens is this. If you're saving money for a purpose, you want to know how much money you want to end up with. So you know what this end amount is. You usually know how many times it's compounded because that's what you're negotiating with the insurance broker who's selling you this thing. The rate it's going to be offered at, you know that too. And what he, that person will be able to tell you is, uh, ultimately, you know how much time you want to have it in for. You want to know when you need that money, how much you need to put in in order to end up with the amount of money that you want in the end. 
and that would be something that you would put away for, say, a kid's education. We're only interested now in, if I put so much money in, how much money am I going to get out? So that's the put in X, get out Y with the information they give me. And it says how much money will be in the account. So how much money will be in the account. That says I'm looking for A of T. So I'm looking for the end amount. After three months, that's time. If $5,000, that's the beginning amount, is invested at an annual rate at 4%, compounded quarterly. So they give you that N equals 4. So I set up my variables. My variables in, uh, in my problem are A of T, A of 0, A sub 0, and R, N, and T. So I look at Y, here's my A of T, A of 0, R, N, and T. Now that says if I have all these variables, if they want me to come out with a value, they, I have to have values for all these variables. That's a key to actually working. How do I know what I'm trying to find? Because the one who's blank is what you're trying to find because you've got information for all of the others. That's also a key when you're in a science class, when you have a formula and you would write down all the variables, then I'll go in and say, oh, I know what the beginning amount is. A sub zero is 5,000 because they gave that to me. I know what the rate is. The rate is 4%. That's 0.04. Quarterly means that N is four. Time is three months, but we need to change months into years. Time is three over 12. So that's three twelfths of a year, which ends up being one over four. Now the only thing I don't have a value for is that guy. So that's who I'm looking for. And that is a way, when you're dealing with a formula, especially, uh, to work word problems. Make a list of your variables and then fill in the information you have. That tells you what you're looking for. So A of T is what I'm looking for and in fact as T is going to be one-fourth. I want to put 0.25. That's the same as one-fourth. That makes it easier for me to work with with my calculator. Is going to be A sub zero which is 5,000 times 1 plus R which is point. 04 divided by n, which is 4, to the n, which is 4, times t, which is 0.25. And now it's just a plug and chug with my calculator. So I take my handy dandy little calculator, and I'll move this over here so I can see the formula at the same time. So it's 5,000. Parenthesis, I just type it in as I see it. 1 plus 0 0.04 divide 4 parenthesis to the, now I've got a 0 0.04, I've got a multiplication here. So in order to get this done correctly, I need to put that exponent in parentheses. And if you go back up to the formula, notice what they did? they put that exponent in parentheses. So I'm now going to put the exponent in parentheses. It's 4 times 0.25. And let me check that out. Make sure I've got it typed in correctly. Now, I should have more than $5,000 in three months. Probably not much more than $5,000 when you come right down to it. And because it's only three months, 5050 bucks. So I got 50 bucks worth of interest on, at 4%. Tell me where you can get 4% interest these days. But if you could get 4% interest, uh, I would have $50 in three months. So my answer would be $5,050 in the end after five months. That's not so bad, is it? Three months. 
Hmm? It was after three months. After three months, yeah. Now here's the problem I have with this problem. How many months are we in? How's, how many times is this being compounded? <coughs> Four, Four, which is what? Well, it is actually every three months. So that says the first compounding. That says the next time it does its interest, which is in another three months, it's going to do interest on 50-50. And then it'll add that. The next time it'll be that 50-50 plus what it's added, we'll get interest on that. So that's compound interest. Cool, huh? Money making money. As long as you don't need it, that's part of the problem. Wind chill formula. We don't have to worry about that, fortunately. Although as I'm looking at with my brother-in-law being here, uh, as I'm looking at what's happening back east, and I look at my hometown in Pennsylvania and where he lives, they're, they're looking at a temperature of, you know, like 15 degrees. With the wind chill, it's like seven. He's like, glad we're here. It has a formula. WC equals w. wind chill. Uh, 35.74 plus point, the blah, 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 T plus <coughs> V plus the, where T <laughs> is the interest, is the, is the air temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and we need to know that because if we were in Canada, it would be degrees centigrade. So I found out when I lived there, uh, not lived there, when I visited there. V is the wind chill, is the wind speed in miles per hour. And so we only really have three variables. We have WC, we have the wind chill, we have T, we have the temperature, and we have V, we have the wind velocity. So we have three variables in this problem. So that means if I'm going to do anything, they need to give me two of the information that I need. I either I need two of these three in order to get the one of them that I want. Round your answer to two decimal places. Use the wind chill formula to calculate the wind chill temperature when the air temperature is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so T is 20, and the wind speed is 30 miles per hour, 30, and then that means the, what I'm looking for is WC, which is the, essentially the Y value when you come right down to it. So what do I know? I know that WC equals 35.74 plus 0.0215 times, oops, 0 0.6215, 6215 times T, which is 20, minus 35.75 times V, which is 30, and that is raised to the 0.16 power. <coughs> so 35.74 plus 0.6215 times T, which is 20, minus 35.75 times 30, which is the velocity, to the 1.6 power, and I forgot something, didn't I? Plus point. <coughs> 4275 times the temperature, which is 20, times the velocity, which is 30.16, or 30 to the 0.16 power. Oh, uck. I don't know who came up with this formula, but it's ucky. So here we go. Uh, we just put it in as we see it. 35.74 plus 0.6215 times 20 minus 35.75. I guess I have to turn it on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this will be a good video, won't it? Uh, let's see, 35.74 plus 0.6215 
times 20 minus 35.75, and this is going to be times 30 raised to the 0.16 power plus 0.4275 times 20 <coughs> times 30 e raised to the 0.16 power. So hopefully that's what we got. I'm just going to trust myself, which I can always be wrong, and you guys will fix it. You'll correct me. Uh, and I come out with Yeah, 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Wouldn't it be a negative? Pardon me? Oh, never mind. So with 30 mile an hour winds, we're takes it down to, with the wind chill factor, 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. 